Thanks, Brother Simon. Uh, good morning, everyone. Nice to uh, to be with you here this morning, although we can't be here in person. Um, and I do bring uh, with me, I, I guess bring is one of those words, right, which is a bit strange, but bring with me the uh, the, the love and, and greetings and fellowship of your uh, brothers and sisters from Kemp's Creek. Um, so I was I was meet, I was speaking at Canberra uh, last week, and you know uh, speaking at Moorbank this week. It's again one of those one of those terminologies, but it's nice to be able to sort of uh, move around the country um, even from the same room. Um, thanks, Brother Stewart. I, I hadn't actually heard the uh, the news from both India and Kabul, um, so thank you for sharing that this morning. And it's um, it's a it's a stark reminder of the fact that our lives are are not our own. Uh, our lives are in the hand of God. And as we meet together to remember our Lord this morning and the, the, the way in which he um, he knew and lived in such a way that God, God was in control of his life as well. Um, it's a, it's a, a very sobering reminder of the, uh, the fleeting nature of the life that we live. Um, as we're looking this morning, and, and Brother Simon's right, the, um, the topic that I've got for, for my uh, discussion this morning is the great high priest um, and our reading takes us back 2000 years to to the upper room where uh, Paul in retrospect is is going through looking at, at how the disciples in that room uh, himself not being one of them of course how the disciples were were given the um, the commandment to remember our Lord um, and to re remember the, the sacrifice that was about to take place you can imagine um, in light of the the dangers and the and the the trials that that are going um, that are facing brother, brothers and sisters around the world at this moment, um, you can imagine that in Christ's own mind, at that particular time in that upper room, his emotions would have been heightened, his stress level would have been uh, would have would have been heightened as well. His heart would have been beating faster than normal as you know in the back of his mind or maybe maybe becoming in the front of his mind was the the reality of the sacrifice that he was going to going to make and he was trying to put that aside for the moment as he focused on uh, focused on the needs of those who were there in that room with him um, and i wonder if you ever thought about where these symbols of bread and wine come from because they don't come from the law of Moses. These, these aren't part of the Passover. Um, these, the Passover was very different. So, so when they're, they're there and they're um, supposedly keeping the Passover, it's a very different Passover to what, what the, most of the Jews later, later on would be, um, would, would be celebrating. So where does this bread and wine come from? And I think um, this is where I want to go back even further in history and make a suggestion to you. And so, the, the direction I'm going to take this talk now is to go back, not, not 2,000 years, but another 2,000 years. And we're going to go all the way back to the time of, of Abraham. And the story I'm going to start with is going to start early one morning. As the sun, and not far from, not far from uh, the city of Jerusalem where, where Jesus and his disciples were, but 2,000 years beforehand, not far from there, the, the sun had just barely topped the hills and the, the early morning dew still lay undisturbed on the ground. Early mist was wafting lazily through the valleys and even the animals were still. And this man was up. He'd made a habit of being up early before first light. But even so, he was startled to hear a camel being driven hard towards him. And a rider burst into view as he rounded a distant hill and galloped up towards the small tent city before dismounting. And he ran over to, to talk to Abraham. This man, this messenger, was a survivor. He'd survived the war that had just taken place between the battles of the kings in Genesis 14. Actually, come, come back with me to, uh, to Genesis 14. This battle had taken place and Abraham wasn't that far away and he didn't know very much about it until such time as he heard news coming back. So we have the battle of the kings being described in this chapter. Four kings against five caught up amongst this battle was Abraham's relative, his nephew, Lot. And they were close, even though they weren't living close by. But back in the previous chapter, um, in, in chapter 13, verse 8, Abram had said to Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. 
So they decided between them to go their separate ways for the sake of peace. And Lot, sadly, chose to go down and dwell in the plain of Sodom and, and eventually had moved closer and closer into the city. But what that meant was that the kings, when, when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah lost the battle, all their goods were taken and the people were taken, including Lot and his household. So we read there in chapter 14 that Lot was amongst those taken. Verse 12 says that. And so Abraham gets the news. Well, actually, it's Abram at this point, isn't it? So I'll keep calling him Abram. He gets the news and he immediately leaps into action. And I imagine that scene early in the morning when Abram is out by the fire. And he gets the news and he calls out. And out of all the tents all around him, there comes an army. And it's an amazing story where he calls and these men answer. And there's 318 men who are born in his own house. Interesting. It's, it's not a picture that I normally get when I picture Abram. He's the one who's trained these men. They're, they're 318 men who are trained for war. Certainly not the picture I have of Abram at 75 or 80 years of age as, as a wandering nomad, um, wandering through various countries and eventually ending up in the country that God has brought him to inherit or would, would bring him to inherit. And here he is with an entire army, 318 trained men, and he leads them out. Abram doesn't just say, all right, I'm an old man. I'm going to be your general. Um, you go and I'll catch up with you. He, he doesn't say that at all. Um, he jumps on his own camel. And I guess I'm using camels a, a little, with a little bit of creative license. Um, I don't know how well trained their horses were. Um, but he jumps on his own camel and off he goes. And he chases the army off all the way to Dan. Now, at the, in the time of the writer of Genesis, Dan was actually unknown. So, so this must have been renamed later or put in, put in the record for context. Because where Dan ended up was right up north of Israel. So he's gone a long way north of the Judean hills, all the way up to the north of Israel as, he, as he's pursuing these five kings. And then he demonstrates, and, and we only have about half a verse to, uh, to prove this, but he demonstrates a degree of strategy that I again find incongruous when I'm thinking about Abram. He splits up his servants like a, a, like a pincer maneuver. He splits them, splits them up by night and, and goes around and attacks the armies. And so his 318 men take on five kings with all of their armies in, in battle. And that's, um, where am I looking at there? Um, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, the, the section from verse 14 to 16. <clears throat> um, and, and we have, uh, uh, I guess, a little bit of a rem reminiscence of, of Gideon in actual fact. He knows that God is with him. Um, and this is a faithful man who, on his own initiative, he does what he knows to be right in God's sight. He goes and he wins that battle. Verse 16, he brings back all the goods. And there's so much caught up in these verses. In, in just these two verses, there's so much, so much activity that we're not told about. We could have a huge battle song like we find in other parts of the Bible, like, like Miriam's song. Or, or later in Judges, things that are amazing take place um, and you get almost like a blow-by-blow -blow description. But that's not the case here. This is just glossed over in the life of Abram. So there's, there's just something that happens in the space of a verse, but he brings back all the goods. Nothing was missing. He brings back all the people, and especially he brings back his brother Lot. Notice the focus that's given, verse 16. That phrase, his brother Lot. There's no animosity. There's no problem between Abram and Lot. They, they were as close as ever. They split because there were problems amongst their households. So he brings back Lot and all the goods and the women and the children. And you have this amazing meeting. Uh, we'll, we'll come and have a look at Hebrews chapter 7, which talks about Melchizedek in a bit more detail. We'll, we'll look at that a little bit later on. Um, but this is, this is where it all starts. 
This is the first record of the meeting between Abram and Melchizedek. So Abram is coming down with all the captives, rejoicing and victorious, and out goes the king of Sodom. And a man by the name of Melchizedek, who is also king, king of Salem. And we find out a little bit more about his life in, in Hebrews. They're meeting in the valley of Shavar. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Verse 17, uh, which is the king's dale. Which king, I wonder? That doesn't actually say. But the Valley of Shavar is also known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat later on in the Old Testament, in particular, um, Joel chapter 3. It's the valley just outside of what we now know to be the city of Jerusalem. And back then, it was much smaller, but known as Salem. So this is right in Melchizedek's backyard. He's looked out over the walls of his admittedly much smaller city than Jerusalem is these days, and he can step outside and meet up with Abram. But he doesn't just meet up by chance. Here he is bringing out bread and wine. And we're told he's the priest of the Most High God. This is amazing. In fact, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of mystique about Melchizedek. Um, the Jews, for instance, let me, let me just indulge in a couple of theories that are out there. Um, the Jews thought and still think that Melchizedek is actually an, a, a title for Shem. Um, this is about 400 years after the flood. And so it was certainly within uh, Shem's lifespan. Um, and one of the reasons that they suggest this um, amongst, amongst others is uh, the fact that when Abram comes to meet Melchizedek, there is this instant respect that Abram has. Now, uh, in the Jewish um, mind, with, with respect to Jew Jewish genealogies, it's the sort of respect that one shows to an ancestor. And you know, ob obviously, um, despite the generations between Shem and Abram, um, Shem would have been his great, 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 great grandfather, um, about eight times removed. Um, so, so that's entirely possible. I'm not saying it is, but it's, uh, it's something we're thinking about. Um, and it would have made sense, Shem becoming the, uh, the family priest for all of the family of Noah. And, and if you think about it, that's going to be everybody who's, <laughs> who's, who's alive on the face of the earth um, after the flood. There's a whole lot of other more ludicrous theories that are out there. Um, you know, various, uh, various sects and religions um, latch on to the mystique of, of Melchizedek and think that he's a shaman or a mystic or um, he's, he's, a, he, he's a, a, a person who's still wandering around the earth somewhere. Um, again, because of this idea that you know, he has no beginning of days or end of life, um, which is what we read later on. But we know the priests are human. Um, so, so there's no... No, that, that theory doesn't hold water. Melchizedek was a man who was there for a reason. And so he comes out and he blesses Abram in verse 19. Just stop and think about that for a moment. This is Abram. This is Abraham. The person to whom God has given the promises. Already. He's already given him the promises. He's already received the first set of promises, and that's going to continue through the next eight chapters or so. But Melchizedek is coming out and blessing, and he comes out and blesses Abraham. Now, if I were coming out to see Abram, I'd be thinking, okay, Abram, I think I'd really like to be blessed by you. <laughs> but, but again, Hebrews, and we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, Hebrews picks this up and says there's a symbol. There's a really important symbol here. Because even though Abram is such a key figure, such a friend of God, such a faithful person, he's being blessed by someone who is even greater. That's how important Melchizedek is to this story. And by the way, the response of Abram is just amazing. He turns to Melchizedek and says, Melchizedek, I'm going to give you one tenth of everything. Now, there's no prescription here, no custom that says after meeting somebody for five minutes, you have to give them a tenth of everything that you have. That, that nothing, nothing like that. This is completely spontaneous. But so significant that it becomes 
law. It becomes part of the law of Moses. Under, under the law, the people of Israel had to give a tenth of what they earned to the priests. Harking back to this particular moment in, in Jewish history. But in this case, in Abram's case, it was spontaneous. It was a gift from the heart. <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, you've got the king of Sodom, the, the evil king of Sodom, who says, I'm here as well. Um, you don't need to give me a gift. Uh, you keep all the stuff. You just give me the people. You keep the money. Give me the people. And Abram, in effect, says, I don't want to have a bar of you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Lot, are you paying attention? I don't want to have anything to do with, with Sodom whatsoever. In order that, verse 23, you should never be able to say, I have made Abram rich. The point is that Abram wanted all of the glory, not just for that battle and that victory, but for everything else that he'd be blessed with in his life. He wanted all of that glory to go to God. This is the mindset of a faithful man where God is first and foremost in his mind. You notice that Melchizedek, as he comes out, his attitude's all about giving. He comes out with bread and wine, these symbols of fellowship. Whereas the king of Sodom is all about taking. You've got this very diverse example of the two kings who are here meeting with, with Abram. Can I take you over to the only other place, well, one, one of two other places in scripture where Mel Melchizedek is mentioned. That's Psalm 110. Because the other one, of course, is Hebrews, I've mentioned already. So Psalm 110. This is the king's psalm. This is a, a messianic psalm. It's a promise by God, and you probably know the start of it really well. <clears throat> psalm 110, verse 1. Yahweh said unto my Lord. And Jesus picks this up. Um, James is probably dealing with this on Sunday, Sunday school this morning. Jesus picks this up um, and, and poses this as a conundrum to the Jews. But, but reading it as, it's, as it stands... Yahweh said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. You know that, you know that verse really well. Um, in fact, uh, long before I was um, baptized, um, you know, noticing that my parents uh, used Yahweh instead of the Lord in, in Bible readings, I said, oh, hey, can I do that? Um, and so dad sat me down and, and said, look, this is what God's name means. It's really important. Um, and here's an example where it's used. So we, we came back here and you know, this, was, this was what we walked through when, when he explained uh, what that was all about. So this psalm, by the way, is quoted in excess of 30 times in the New Testament. It's one of those key, key psalms where there's a promise here by God that Messiah would be given the power and the blessing of Almighty God himself. And God will be the one to fight his battles. Let's, let's keep reading the first next few verses. Yahweh will send out the rod of his strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the, or spontaneous or, or giving. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Yahweh hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is the promise by God to Messiah, who would be reading this 2,000 years into the future, or maybe, maybe 1,000 by the time the Psalms are being written, but 1,000 years into the future, and reading about this promise that would, that would take effect, linking him to Melchizedek. And then it goes on to talk about judgment, which is very interesting. It's all very dramatic and military and violent. Um, but interestingly enough, where the rest of this psalm is quoted in the New Testament, it doesn't focus on judgment. It doesn't focus on destruction. Instead, it's talking about what the king, what Messiah will do for his people. It's all about giving. So let's focus in on the order of Melchizedek. What is, what is the order? Because the word order implies structure and, and some sort of form. What we know of Melchizedek was found in about three or four verses back in Genesis. That was it. 
There's no list of how the priesthood of Melchizedek was going to operate. There's no list of duties they'd perform. There's no, no clarity about how the family of Melchizedek would continue on the tasks. And I think that's the point. That's what the writer of Hebrews picks up, that the order of Melchizedek is not something that's prescribed by law. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And that word forever is really important. The value of the high priest's life is really significant because under the law, there was provision for someone who'd accidentally caused the deaths of another to the death of another to, to run away from, from the family of the victim, to find refuge in one of the six cities that were called the cities of refuge. In a time and under a law that allowed the punishment to fit the crime, this gave time for the matter to be investigated fully and the refugee was able to live safely in that city for as long as the high priest lived. So their safety was linked to the life, to the lifespan of the high priest. If he's a healthy 25 year old, then there's a degree of comfort. Um, but if the high priest was a doddering old man, then the refugee is not guaranteed long to find a way to make reparations. This idea though, that Jesus is going to be our high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek means that our safety, our security is tied not to, a, not to a mortal lifespan, but to an everlasting high priest. There's a lot of comfort to be found in, in those words. So let's go over to Hebrews. And if I, if I happen to mention that Paul's the author, um, take it with a grain of salt because uh, it, it's, a, it's a supposition. Um, in fact, there's, there's a link, I'm going to Hebrews seven, but there's a link back to Hebrews five and six, specifically chapter six, verse 19, talking about the hope that we have, which is an anchor for our soul, something we can hold on to, sure and steadfast. And, and we know this because Jesus has already gone where we could not. He's already entered into that hope, which is what we remember this morning. He's gone through the veil. He's been made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, directly quoting those words from Psalm 110. But then as we read, as you glance through further into, uh, into Hebrews chapter 7, Paul feels the need to explain. For this Melchizedek, he says, this one that we're talking about, this king of Salem, the priest of the most high God, the one who met Abraham, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all. This, this is the one. There's a whole lot of symbology in around what we're told about Melchizedek, but there's even more symbology about what we're not told about him. And this is the part um, that the writer of the Hebrews is un unfolding here. Yes, Melchizedek is the king of Salem and his name means king of righteousness. So he's king of righteousness according to his title and he's king of Salem, which means king of peace. King of righteousness and king of peace, put those two, two things together. And it's a very apt description very apt type of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we had more time, um, we could probably go over to James chapter three and talk about how righteousness is the only way that God has deemed that we can have peace. You can look that one up in, your, in, in James chapter three in your own time. So we need to start with righteousness before we can enjoy proper peace. This is the reason why the wicked have no peace because they don't have the right starting point. They don't have right righteousness as that foundation on which to build peace. So you have mentioned here in, in Hebrews 7, in verse 3, the heritage, or, or maybe the lack of heritage of Melchizedek. Here he is popping up in the record, and Melchizedek's probably not his real name. Um, it's probably a title. So we don't know his family. We don't know his history. It, that was really important for the Jews. Who are you? Whose son are you? Where do you come from? Where do you fit in? What box do you fit, fit into? And Melchizedek had none of that. They had no idea where he came from. They had no idea what his qualification was to be high priest, except the scripture said he was the priest of the most high God. 
We don't know anything more. We don't know who his father or mother are. We don't know who his descendants are. There's nothing written. It's a mystery. And this would have played on the mind of the Jewish believer. <laughs> and, and Paul says there's a reason here. There's a pattern. The reason is that he's a type of the son of God. In order for Jesus to become high priest, there had to be a change in the law. He actually goes on and says so in, in verse, verse 12, in as many words. The law has to be changed. Verse 12, the priesthood, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. It has to happen because the law itself can't save. It's weak and ineffective, ineffective. Whoa. Okay, how did you get that, Paul? The law is supposed to be holy and just and good. And you said so in, in other, in, in other uh, letters to other ecclesias. Well, yes, it was all of those things, but it was not effective for the salvation of God's people. And that was the whole point. That was why the law had to be remade and a new order, a new priesthood needed to be established. Not one that was based on seniority. The oldest son of the high priest became the next high priest. That was the way it was done. This one is based on God's blessing. Just, just uh, glance down to verse 16. I love this. I uh, love, love this thought. Normally, the priesthood was made by law, the family lineage. But now that this new priesthood is not made by a mortal law, but after the power of an endless life. After the power of an endless life. And so Jesus Christ was not ordained to be high priest because it was written down in the law. He was ordained to be the high priest, our high priest, by virtue of the fact that he is the immortal son of God. After the power of an endless life. That's the connection being made. Now, that's interesting, right? Because it then begs the question for us, when we are made immortal by God's grace, is that the point at which we also, by virtue of being immortal beings, become priests of the Most High God, as is talked about in Revelation? I tend to think that, that this, that's what this verse 16 is talking about. We follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ by becoming priests, not because of the Levitical law, but priests because we're immortal. And we're priests after the order of Melchizedek, just like the Lord Jesus Christ is. See, there's a whole lot of discrepancies. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Levi. He had to be made a priest outside the construct of the law itself. No family lineage, no age is given, no indication of how old or otherwise Melchizedek was. Um, and the point there is pointing to Moses himself saying, well, you're able to be a priest between the ages of 20 and 50 under the law. You didn't have a choice. Before 20, couldn't be a priest. After 50, couldn't be a priest. But with Melchizedek, there's no indication of any of those laws. There's none of those constraints nor are they applying to the Lord Jesus Christ because he is a priest due to the fact that he has endless life and he's continuing to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Which brings us to the upper room. The link to Melchizedek is made even stronger when Jesus sits in the upper room with his disciples and st instead of a traditional Passover meal, he institutes the symbols of bread and wine not found in the law, not found in the Passover. This is, this is found, though, in the hands of Melchizedek. And again, Jesus makes the point that what we're celebrating here this morning together is greater and older than the law. There's another interesting point uh, in verse 20, if I can uh, draw your attention to, to verse 20. Um, Christ's appointment was by, an, was by an oath. Most priests were ordained without an oath. Now, this is something that's fairly familiar with us. Um, Scott Morrison, when he takes the office of, of prime minister, puts his hand on a Bible and repeats an oath that he'll be the prime minister and serve the country. And that's fairly commonplace amongst rulers and clergy and various churches these days. But not so in the law of Moses. There was no oath that they took. 
There was no oath that was given for them to be made priests, but Jesus Christ, it's different. He is anointed by an oath. Verse 21, God swears by himself that you will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord swear and will not repent. You can see the link back to Psalm 110. That's the promise given by God of the fact that Jesus would be priest forever. And then you come down to verse 25. One of the virtues of this high priest that is that as we stop and remember him in a moment of silence and prayer and contemplation this morning, he is the one, he is the only one who is able to save us to the uttermost. Well, my margin says forevermore. It's got a sense of completely or for all time to save those who come to God by him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. This is the great high priest that we come to remember this morning. And I love the turn of phrase as, as, as he, he transitions. There's no real transition, but as he moves from, from what we know of Hebrews 7 to Hebrews chapter 8, just have a look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, which starts with, hey, if you haven't been paying attention or if you've lost the flow of thought, um, this is the point. This is, this is what we're getting at. He says, verse 1, now the of the things which we've spoken, this is the sum. Let me summarize it for you. We have a high priest who's set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. <laughs> there's, there's the summary. And this great high priest that we're here to remember, an immortal high priest, sanctified and appointed and established by a heavenly father. Before I finish up, I'm just going to finish in, in just a moment, but I have one more thought for you to consider. As, as we, we ready ourselves to think about Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to his father in heaven, the thought is this, we take our minds all the way back to Abram and there he was on that mountaintop amongst the tents with his family all around him and the messenger coming up the hill. Stop and think about this. If Abram had not loved his brother, if Abram had not cared enough about Lot to go out and form an army and go chasing the enemy all the way up to Dan, to have that battle to bring him back. If he hadn't cared that much, he would never have met Melchizedek. The link there for us is that we get to meet Jesus by demonstrating our love for our brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm.